Thank you, first, for the invitation to be here, even though it came with this string attached of having to introduce myself, which was, frankly, the most stressful part of giving this talk. <laughs> um, but Michael mentioned that I should try and say something with a little bit of historical perspective. Um, so I thought, well, OK. Uh, I guess I'll start at the beginning. Um, so this is me. <laughs> um, I have like an hour, right? <laughs> Let's be generous and say it's me 20-something-ish years ago. Uh, metaphorically speaking, at the beginning of my career, when I was a naive undergraduate at the University of Arizona with basically no knowledge of what virology was or how viruses really worked. And that is until I was lucky enough to stumble on what I assumed was a pretty um, uh, solid, non-fictional account of what the day-to-day -day life of your everyday virologist was like. And the hot zone, I kid you not, <laughs> was my first introduction to virology. It was the reason that I ended up picking biology as my major after having been undeclared for three years. And it was the reason that I decided to become a virologist. And then, um, I started perusing the American Society for Virology website, and they actually have this section called 10 Frequently Asked Questions um, about training in virology. And, and question number 10 really caught my eye, which was, how do I know a career in virology is right for me? And you can imagine my disappointment when uh, their answer to this question was, quote, if your image of being a virologist comes from watching Outbreak, I loved that movie, by the way, at the time. <laughs> or reading The Hot Zone, you probably have a skewed idea of what the work entails. So I was off to a really illustrious start to my career. But nonetheless, I forged on and went ahead and got a PhD in virology and then still did some more virology for my postdoc in San Francisco. And I'm still doing virology at Berkeley. And you can read about the details of that trajectory in the bio. But what I want to say is that even though I have never gotten to work on a BSL-4 pathogen that makes your eyeballs bleed, or traipse through the jungle every day looking for new emerging viruses, I am still really excited about the type of virology that we do here. And that's in part because of the questions um, that I find fascinating, but in a larger part because of the group of people that I get to work with every day. And these scientists, as well as their predecessors who have already graduated from the lab, are really what have determined my success here. So thank you guys for making me look good. <laughs> OK, with that, um, let's talk about the science. So we work on herpes, which is, of course, everywhere. It's endemic in humans, um, but probably infects all vertebrate animals. Even some invertebrates like oysters and coral have herpes. And these are um, large, double-stranded DNA viruses that replicate in the nucleus. Uh, one of their defining features is that once you're infected with a herpes virus, of course, you can never clear it. And so what that means is that these viruses are really well adapted to coexisting with us. And that adaptation has been evolutionarily honed over long periods of time because these are really ancient viruses. And I think that this makes them extremely powerful tools to understand virus-host interactions, which is what we're interested in. We study the gamma herpes virus subfamily, um, which contains two human viruses, the virus we mostly work on, which is Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus, or KSHV. Uh, this is the etiologic agent of the main AIDS-defining illness of the 1980s, Kaposi sarcoma, and also some B-cell lymphoproliferative disorders. Um, and also, um, uh, Burkitt's lymphoma is, caused, is another cancer caused by a human virus in this subfamily, Epstein-Barr virus. And we also spend a lot of time working on a mouse virus that's a close relative of these two human viruses called murine gamma herpes virus 68, or MHV 68. And this was originally isolated from bank foals, but it turns out it serves as a really useful model system to probe the in vivo biology of these human viruses and also to study their lytic cycle cascade, which is um, uh, much easier uh, to study in this sort of more tractable system. 
And so um, where my lab operates basically is the intersection between herpes virology and gene expression. And you can sort of think of gene expression as like a really complicated circuit in which many, many, many different inputs all have to somehow coordinate to give a particular gene expression landscape output. And viruses, and DNA viruses like herpes in particular, um, interface with many of the key regulators of this circuit. And that's because their gene expression strategies closely mimic that of the host, but they basically have to steal the relevant machinery. And so we think that that means that by trying to understand how they interface with these various um, uh, regulators, we can learn about some of the fundamental principles and players involved in gene expression control. And so what I'm going to tell you today is a, a new story that we have going on um, that's um, been worked on by a postdoc in the lab, John Karolich, that centers on this area of the circuit. And that's a class of non-coding RNAs um, that are derived from retrotransposons. So as I think probably every biologist on the planet now appreciates, most of our genomes are non-coding. And in fact, the biological complexity doesn't correlate with coding sequence, but instead it correlates with the expansion of non-coding sequences. And for mammals, that's like 98% of our genome. And about half of that non-coding sequence, so about half of our genomes, are comprised of transposable elements. And so those are things like um, uh, long and short um, uh, uh, lines and signs, long and short nuclear elements, LTR elements, DNA transposons, et cetera. And among these transposable elements, the class that produces exclusively non-coding RNAs are the short interspersed nuclear elements, or the signs. And these are transcribed by RNA polymerase three. They're non-autonomous, which means they can't jump around on their own, and that's because, as I said, they're exclusively non-coding. Um, in humans, they're called the ALU RNAs, and in mice, they're called B1 and B2 RNAs, which are about 135 and 200-ish nucleotides each. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about the signs is that together, B1 and B2 are present in nearly a million different copies scattered throughout the mammalian genome. So they're hyperabundant. But in fact, in most healthy somatic cells, their expression is suppressed. And so you see almost no sign expression. But under certain types of stress, including viral infection, some unknown subset of these million loci can get turned on. And we started to get really interested in the question of, why might this be the case? Might these non-coding RNAs have somehow been co-opted for functions related to stresses in cells, stresses in cells like infection? And so um, John started to look at this in the context of uh, MHV68 infection, and the first thing that he did was show, as we would have expected, that if you infect cells with MHV68, you can get sign induction. And so this is um, in NIH3T3 cells, but in fact, he sees this in um, every cell type that he's looked at. This is a primer extension assay, which is necessary to make sure that you're looking at actively transcribing signs instead of things that are just embedded within um, protein coding genes. And as you can see here in this second lane, which is uninfected cells, we pretty much see almost no sign expression, as I told you, because they're very silenced. But as soon as he adds virus to cells, here as early as three hours, but in fact we can detect it sooner than that, you see induction of sign RNAs, and those RNAs accumulate um, and uh, build up over the course of the viral infection. As I mentioned, these are transcribed by RNA polymerase 3, but in fact we don't see induction of any other RNA Pol3 transcript. And we've looked at a whole variety of these, some of which are shown here, things like 5S ribosomal RNA, tRNA, 7SL RNA. None of these change at all during infection. It's just that we get selective induction of sign RNAs. We can also see these in, uh, in the context of in vivo infection. If we infect the mice, harvest their lungs, we can see uh, an infection-linked induction of signs. So I'm just going to summarize a little bit of the characterization that John's done um, for this sign system. Um, what he's seen, first of all, he can show that this activation really is at the level of transcription by doing nuclear run-on assays. Um, he also um, shows that um, sign non-coding RNAs induced by the virus can accumulate both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. So if they were to have some function, it could be in either or both compartments. 
And then third, he sees both types of sign RNAs, B1 and B2, getting induced, but really it's B2 that accumulates to remarkable levels. And in fact, we estimate that um, more than five times 10 to the fifth copies per cell of B2 RNAs accumulate, which is a ton of RNA. And so um, we then basically are really interested in this question of might these inducible non-coding RNAs have been co-opted for specific functions during infection? And they've historically been thought of as just selfish elements. And so to test this, what we wanted to do first was ask, well, we know that these get turned on right after infection. What happens to the ability of the virus to express its genes if we prevent signs from getting induced? So there are two ways that you can do this. You can either treat cells with an RNA polymerase 3 inhibitor um, to basically block their induction, or the better experiment, because it's more specific, is you can treat cells with antisense oligonucleotides that are specific to either the uh, B1 or B2 sign consensus sequence, so you're specifically depleting those from the cells. And so um, he does this, and then infects with virus, and then we can measure um, gene expression by um, RTQPCR. And so this is just a blot here showing that we do get very nice reduction in the relevant um, B1 or uh, B2 sign upon ASO treatment. But the exciting result was that, in fact, if um, we look at either 24 hours post-infection or 72 hours post-infection, we see a really significant decrease in every viral gene level that we look at um, in, if, in cells that are um, depleted for B2 signs. And this is specific for B2, because if we deplete for, um, B1 from these cells, we basically don't see any effect on viral genes. And it's also specific for viral genes, because we don't see any effect on a panel of cellular genes that we look at. And in fact, if anything, some of the cellular genes increase in response to um, depletion of B2 sign RNA. And so one of the other things that was sort of striking to us about this is um, herpes viruses and DNA viruses in general express their genes in a, in a cascade. So things are expressed early or middle or late in the life cycle. And he's looking at genes here that can represent not just one kinetic class, but multiple kinetic classes. So that says that um, uh, there's sort of almost an across the board decrease in viral gene expression. This tells us that the mechanism by which signs are involved in viral gene expression is probably not through association with specific promoters. In fact, we have no evidence for that. But instead, probably acting very early on at something that can control the progression of the viral um, gene expression cascade. And in uh, uh, gamma herpes viruses, there's one protein that does this. Um, it's called RTA. It's known as the master lytic switch protein. It's the major lytic transcriptional transactivator that can induce expression, is expressed very early. It can induce expression of um, either directly or indirectly of a number of different viral genes. And its expression is basically sufficient to set the whole lytic cascade in motion. So if you have enhanced RTA activity, you can boost viral gene expression. You have decreased RTA activity, you'll have dampened viral gene expression. And RTA itself being a really important protein, as you can envision, have lots of ways of being regulated in the cell. But one that really caught our eye was an observation by Ping Wei Feng's group at USC about five years ago, in which he'd shown that one of the ways that RTA activity is regulated is through phosphorylation. And that during MHV68 infection, um, the virus activates this kinase, IKK beta, which is part of the NF-kappa B signaling cascade. And that kinase directly phosphorylates RTA at specific specific positions, and this enhances its transcriptional transactivation activity. And they went on to show that one of the ways that the virus can induce IKK beta activity is through um, activation of the antiviral signaling cascade through the protein MABs. But in fact, this only resulted in partial activity. So there was sort of this missing link for how do you get full kinase activation. And what I'm going to show you is that um, our data suggests that that missing link is the sign RNAs. And these can lead to um, uh, full activation of this kinase and enhanced RT activity. And the reason we first started thinking about this was John had done an experiment basically to explore whether or not just expression of sign RNAs out of the context of infection could impact the activity of a variety of different promoters or promoter elements. And this was your basic experiment of cloning promoter elements in front of a luciferase reporter and then expressing sign RNAs and seeing if you had any specific response. And while most of the promoters didn't show much of a response, one of the ones that did was the NF-kappa B reporter. 
So you can see here that um, in the presence of B1, you get some level of induction of the NF-kappa B promoter, but a much more robust induction in the presence of B2 RNA. And this is specific for expression of these signs because if you do this negative control where you treat with an inhibitor of RNA pol 3 which is required for sign expression, you don't see any activation of NF-kappa B. So this suggests that sign expression alone, out of the context of viral infection, is um, sufficient to, at some stage, trigger activation of the NF-kappa B pathway, and potentially upstream enough that it could be a regulator or activator of um, IKK beta here. And so if this were the case, then you'd assume um, if IKK beta activity is increasing, that signs themselves should be able to directly increase the phosphorylation level of RTA. And so John tested this by sort of the classic orthophosphate labeling experiment, where he takes cells that are expressing a flag tag version of RTA, um, plus or minus B1 or B2 signs. Again, this is out of the context of infection, so we're trying to simplify the system and not have uh, a confounding effects of lots of other signaling cascades that are activated by the virus. Um, and then he adds P32 labeled orthophosphate, which is going to, the label is going to get transferred to proteins as they're being phosphorylated by kinases, and you purify RTA, and you can quantify its level of phosphorylation basically by P32 incorporation. And indeed, what he sees is that compared to cells expressing just a scramble RNA, um, in the presence of B1 sign or B2 sign, there's a significant increase in um, RTA phosphorylation. And we would assume this means that there's going to be an increase in RTA's transcriptional transactivation activity. And so this you can test by assessing the ability of RTA to activate um, promoters that it's known to be responsive to its presence. And it's known to activate its own promoter, um, the RTA promoter, as well as several others, including OR57 and M3. These are two viral promoters. And so what we see here is that um, expression of signs alone basically have no effect on these promoters in the absence of RTA. So they're not directly affecting it. But um, RTA expression by itself is well known to have a basal level of transcriptional activation at each of these promoters. In the presence of B1 sign, we get a little blip in activity, but a more marked increase in the presence of B2. So B2 sign expression is enhancing the transcriptional activity of wild type RTA. And this depends on the ability of RTA to be phosphorylated by IKK beta, because instead, if we include a mutant of RTA that has point mutations in those known phosphorylation sites, we don't lose the basal transcriptional activation at any of these promoters, but we do completely lose responsiveness to the expression of the sign RNAs. And so this indicates that sign effects on viral promoters are RTA dependent and require RTA's IKK beta um, phosphorylation sites. And so collectively, this indicates that um, signs may be serving a proviral role in this context and enhancing viral replication. And so um, to test this, we ask then, how well does the virus replicate in cells if we deplete these non-coding RNAs, again, using the antisense oligonucleotides? And what we see is that in cells treated with control oligos, um, there's a, this is in a multi-step growth curve now where you start with a low MOI infection and then, uh, and then measure viral replication. When we deplete B2 signs, there's a significant decrease in MHV68 replication, a little bit more than tenfold. And again, this is specific for B2. We see no effect when we deplete um, the B1 uh, in complete agreement with this other data that I've shown you and, and our observation that B1 levels don't accumulate nearly as robustly as B2 levels do during infection. Okay, so um, thus, I think we can say that sign induction is, in this case, beneficial for the virus. So then we started thinking, you know, viruses tend not to be great inventors. They're better thieves. And so if they've found a function for these non-coding RNAs, probably the cell has too. Um, and we started to wonder what that might be. And in fact, there is emerging evidence indicating that um, transcribed sign RNAs can have effects on cell physiology and gene expression. Um, two of the nicest examples, I think, are um, from the Goodrich group, who's shown that during heat shock induction of sign RNAs, um, a subset of these can bind RNA polymerase II and repress the transcription of at least a subset of promoters during heat shock. And then more recently, 
recently an observation indicating that um, uh, signs that get aberrantly induced in the human eye, so these are the ALU RNAs, can activate the NLRP3 inflammasome, lead to inflammation in the eye and macular degeneration. And so this indicates that they probably are having some role um, uh, in stressed cells, but we wanted to figure out what that role might be in the context of infection. Problem is, one of the things that I think has inhibited the ability to really mechanistically understand what signs could be doing in cells when they're transcribed is the fact that we know almost nothing about which of these million loci are actually turned on, which have transcriptional potential, are the same subsets turned on, is it one, is it a thousand, who knows? And so we've been able to overcome this by the development of a technique that John calls SignSeq. It's basically a sequencing-based technique that combines sign-specific RNA amplification um, through primer extension and a size selection step because the sign RNAs are very defined size. And then we can build libraries and use these after their sequence to map back activated sign loci. Even though these are um, relatively repetitive sequences, there's actually enough diversity between sign loci that you can map them back to individual sites in the genome. And when he did this, we were really surprised to see that, in fact, um, after he built what was basically the first genome-wide sign activation map during MHV68 infection, that conservatively speaking, at least 30,000 different loci became activated in response to viral infection. And if we look at where these loci are, um, they're in and nearby lots of protein coding genes, messenger or PAL2 transcripts, things that are um, in promoter regions, lots of them in introns and even some of them in uh, UTR sequences of messenger RNAs. And more striking to us was when we looked at the annotation of these PAL2 transcribed genes that were um, nearby the active sign loci, we saw really strong signatures for genes involved in viral infection and transcription. And I think this suggests that these activated sign RNAs could play some role in regulating these genes that get turned on in response to infection. We can envision lots of different ways that this could happen, um, one of which we've shown already is through RNA-RNA um, interactions. And I'm not going to show you the data for this. You can um, ask John about it afterwards. But just to summarize, this occurs when an, uh, a sign loci locus becomes active um, and actively transcribed in the inverse orientation in a region of the genome that corresponds to the three prime UTR of a messenger RNA. So you get production of this long messenger RNA and this shorter sign RNA, and they form a perfect um, complementarity. So you get a, an RNA RNA hybrid that forms in cells, and this leads to um, A to I editing of the messenger RNA and specific nuclear retention of this cognate messenger RNA. And this is actually um, the first demonstration of a selective regulation of RNA export through non-coding RNAs like this. So that's one way, but there are probably lots of other ways in which these signs could be regulating um, host responses to infection or these um, gene expression uh, strategies. Um, for example, those that are in promoters could alter the transcriptional environment of neighboring genes. Those that get activated within introns could alter splicing or alternative splicing. And then, as I mentioned in the introduction, we know that um, signs uh, that get expressed during infection are not just localized to the nucleus, but many of them populate the cytoplasm as well. And so um, we're excited about the possibility that in that location they could be involved somehow in pathogen sensing. And one of the things that John's done is developed ways to purify the sign um, ribonucleoprotein complex to look at what cellular factors are associated with these sign RNAs. And in fact, he sees a number of proteins that could be consistent with this type of a function. Okay, so lots of things to explore, and with that, I will end and um, acknowledge uh, John Karolich, who was um, really almost the sole driver of this project. Um, we had help on the deep sequencing analysis from the QB3 um, computational genomics lab here, um, which at the time was run by Ravi Alla. And Emma Abernathy, a, a student in the lab, has helped with some of the, the virus quantification experiments. And I'd be happy to take any questions. So 
right, so what you're asking, I think, is how does the virus activate these in the first place? Is it just directly through binding the cell surface receptor, or is it some other mechanism that, that triggers IKK beta activation? Is that your question? Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like no. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so um, we don't know whether sign is binding IKK beta directly, but we have started to look into how is it that signs themselves can get activated, and what is it about viral infection that triggers activation of these um, uh, Paul 3 transcripts. We know, I don't think it's the specific viral receptor, though I do think that, um, and we've shown, that just binding of the virus to the surface of the cell is enough to transiently induce sign transcription. Not enough for sustained sign transcription. For that, you actually have to have viral gene expression. So I think it's sort of a biphasic thing. There's initial stress response, and we know that TLR signaling, if you just put a TLR ligand like CPG on cells, um, you can get sign activation as well. So I think it's through that pathway that you get the initial trigger, but then there's some other aspect of continued viral replication that allows allows sustained accumulation, and whether that's also through um, something like innate immune response and TLR or something else, we don't know. Yeah, is it specific to this particular herpes virus or is it more generalizable to other viruses? And I would say that it's likely generalizable to tons of different viruses. We know from early work in the 1980s by Barbara Panning and Jim Smiley's group that herpes simplex type 1 and human adenovirus um, can induce um, alu RNAs in um, HeLa cells, and I think they also looked in 293 cells maybe. Um, but it, there are also lots of other types of stresses that can induce signs, things like heat shock um, or other, you know, transcriptional stresses, et cetera. So I think that there are many pathways to sign induction, but the thing that we're particularly enthusiastic about is the fact that we see specific signatures linked to infection for MHV68 induced sign induction to me suggests that we may not see the same profile of signs activated for every single stress. So a heat shock stress or an RNA virus stress or a bacterial stress may induce a different subset if these really have um, evolved to be co-opted to, to help regulate those specific genes. Oh uh, yes, yeah, so uh, tell me if I got this right. The, this is not, uh, evolutionarily speaking, it's not just a rude one-way exploitation of uh, these uh, eukaryotes or mammals in particular here, by these uh, viruses. And I mean, this is the suggestion, the larger picture, if I'm getting this right, really interesting suggestion of your work. Namely, it's some cooperative venture, and in fact, you're demonstrating, oh, there's value in these things during viral infection. It looks like it, we aren't, you haven't clarified the balance there. I mean, it's promoting both sides, but still, there's a real role of the of the host benefiting from the activations that you. Uh, that's described. right. That that's that's the thing that that. Um the idea that we are excited by and have not yet proven, but you know this concept that has sort of long been thought that retrotransposons are just strictly selfish elements and the host tries to keep them suppressed because they do nothing but harm through the potential for insertional mutagenesis and other sorts of things. But, but there is evidence um, that at least even the non-transcribed signs have been co-opted by cells um, to function as boundary elements and evolution of sort of enhancer elements and other sorts of things like that. Um, but what we would argue is that the actual transcribed RNAs have been co-opted and somehow functionalized by cells as well. And there are tons of examples, of, I'm sure as you know, of you know, pathways that are used by the host for one thing and then viruses sort of steal them for their own purpose. And so we like to think that this may be that type of interplay where the host has co-opted these to deal with different types of stress, but the virus has sort of stolen a part of that to benefit itself. And the, just a brief follow-up, so that 98% then, trying to view it in this uh, context that you've described, it's, uh, it, it's essentially uh, the viruses are, uh, are the beneficiaries, but they're just uh, hanging on there. And the, 
cooperative arrangement is an essential part of this. We, I don't know to what degree yet the cooperative arrangement is essential, but, but I, would, I, I would hypothesize that there is some sort of, of, of um, use on both sides, the, the virus and the host, and to what extent that at this point is cooperative or one versus the other, or whether it can still have an antiviral function for the host that we just, you know, and, and that some aspect of it is used by the virus, we don't yet know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you targeted the cytoplasmic sign with an siRNA? We have not. And I don't, you know, okay, so the way that we're doing the experiment, though, is we're expressing the ASOs before viral infection. So in theory, um, what could be going on is that they're getting degraded in the nucleus before they have a chance of getting into the cytoplasm. And so we, what we should do probably is a fractionation experiment to confirm that we're actually seeing depletion in both compartments as opposed to just in the nucleus. But, but that is, that's the hypothesis at this point is that you're just sort of broadly targeting them as soon as they're getting transcribed, so you're depleting both compartments before they have a chance of getting out. But if not, you're right, an SI approach would be appropriate. Thanks.